The Shemitah is the seventh year of a seven-year cycle on the Hebrew calendar and goes back 4,000 years to ancient Israel. It is to be a sabbatical, a year of rest for the land. In addition to a year of rest for the land, at the end of that seventh year, all debts are to be forgiven, which is a complete economic and financial reset. Financial markets in the U.S. and around the world today seem to track or be in alignment with this cycle. And they have been for over a hundred years. Hi, I'm Ben Ripond. Today is August 9th, 2022. Welcome to my YouTube broadcast. I'm going to begin by showing a video which for a couple of minutes, it gives the background of the Shemitah. It, uh, yes, it's on the Hebrew calendar. It's for the Jewish people. It's uh, agricultural in nature. It's 4,000 years old, but there is relevance that's going on today and a huge amount of correlation to the stock market. And there has been for a hundred years. All, almost precise, uh, kind of amazing. And this triggered actually Jonathan Kahn writing the book, his book, uh, The Mystery of the Shemitah. But I'll play this clip. It'll just give you a couple of minutes of background, and then I'll go into the historical pieces and how that relates to today and the next 47 days. So here's this uh, clip. Ladies and gentlemen, so in today's video, we're going to do an update about the Shemitah. So I've done a video in the past about this topic. I had really positive feedback, people reaching out to me, and I've been uh, learning a bit more about this topic. So let's get to it. Uh -huh. So the Shemitah is the Sabbath year, literally meaning release. Also called the sabbatical year is the seventh year of a seven year agricultural cycle mandated by the Torah. The Shemitah mandates debt forgiveness and that field and field workers rest. Other meanings I found of Shemitah or let's say other interpretations or what Shemitah might represent is the shakening, collapse, fall, renew or reset. In the book of Leviticus, God spoke to Moses at Mount Sinai telling him to speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you come to the land that I'm giving you, the land must be given a rest period, a Sabbath to God. For six years, you may plant your fields, prune your vineyards and harvest your crops. But the seventh year is a Sabbath. So traditionally, this agricultural cycle mandated the Jewish people to work the land for six years plant seed, harvest, but on the seventh year to let the land go to rest. Now with time, people have noticed that they've been major events happening during Shemitah. There were the rise of empires, the fall of empires, uh, beginnings of wars, ending of wars, and financial collapse. So this is where I'm mostly going to be focusing on this video is the financial impact that occurs during a Shemitah year. Almost all financial collapses occur during a Shemitah year. So when I've looked in the past 100 years, almost all Shemitah years have been impacted financially. So I'm going to give you the uh, po political the economic and the financial collapses that have happened. And I'm actually going to go all the way back in our country to the signing of the Declaration of Independence and the beginning of the Revolutionary War. And not everyone, but I'm going to hit some highlights and show you uh, what has happened and how that has correlated with the Shemitah. Uh, very interesting. And if you're interested in history or you're interested particularly in financial history, uh, I think you'll find this interesting. So I'll begin 
by saying that the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776 at the beginning of a Shemitah year. The Revolutionary War began right after that and ended in 1783, the beginning of a Shemitah year. Mexican-American War began in 1846, the beginning of a Shemitah year. The Civil War began in 1861, the beginning of a Shemitah year. Panic, they called them back then panics. Today they call them crashes, but panic of 1896. It was in the depths of the economic depression in the heart of a Shemitah year. Panic of 1903, the end of a Shemitah year. In 1917, the U.S. and other countries entered World War I, and the Russian Romanov family dynasty and the Russian Empire collapsed in the last month of a Shemitah year. 1931, the stock market had collapsed 88%. Most people lost everything they had, ushering in the Great Depression, the end of a Shemitah year. In 1938, still in the Great Depression, the stock market collapsed another 50% after it had risen, ushering in uh, a severe recession. 1945, World War II ended. Japan, Germany, Poland, and Austria were in ruins at the end of the Shemitah year. The stock market collapse of 1966 occurred at the end of a Shemitah year. The stock market crash of 1973 occurred at the end of a Shemitah year. And it went until the end of 1974 and lost 50% of its value. In 1979, the stock market began its collapse and went until 1982. And oil prices peaked and there were gasoline shortages and you and I remember, probably remember, the uh, lines at the gas pumps. In 1987, the stock market began its collapse. Excuse me, in 1987, uh, the stock market crashed 33% on Black Monday. Perhaps you remember that at the end of a Shemitah year. The bond market crashed in 1994 in a Shemitah year. 2001, the attack on the World Trade Center in the last week of a Shemitah year. And when the stock in the stock market closed and then it, when it reopened on September 17th, it dropped 7% the last day of a Shemitah year. And it had the largest point drop in history at the close of that week. In 2008, the largest stock market loss in history of 777 points occurred on the last day of the Shemitah year, September 29th. In 2015, the Shanghai stock market crashed 30% in three weeks during the heart of a Shemitah year. And here we are today, 2022, approaching, we're at the end, or approaching the very end of a Shemitah year. This began last September 2021, and it will end on September 25th, 2022. Today, the 9th of August, we are 47 days, 47 calendar days away from the end of the Shemitah. This is not only a Shemitah year, the seventh year in a cycle, but it is what's called a super Shemitah year, which is the seventh year of seven seven-year cycles. So it's the 49th year, and of course that only occurs every 49 years. And 
this has particular significance because it has a heightened um, importance on the Jewish calendar. And you may think, Ben, this just seems weird. You know, why, why does all of this uh, Shemitah year and letting the land rest and forgiving debts, what does that have to do with today? I have just chronicled for you all of the crashes, the, the beginning of wars, the ending of wars, the financial stock market crashes, bond market crashes, going back a couple of hundred years, they seem to correlate with Shemitah year. And I can't tell you exactly why. All I can tell you is that that has happened. And it appears to be a pattern, and there are people who study this. Each time, it is not precise, I will point out. It does not happen exactly in the last month or the last week or the last day exactly. It oftentimes happens in, usually, it happens in the Shemitah year, and more often than not, it does occur in the last month toward the end of the Shemitah year. The reason I'm bringing this up, I covered this a couple of weeks ago, or a few weeks ago, and the reason I'm bringing it up is because we are 47 days away from the end of the Shemitah year. I'm not trying to scare you or be negative. What I'm trying to do is prepare you, prepare you for what has happened historically, and if that happens again, that you are prepared. Now, here are the things that could, the way this could have, could play out. This year, if we, we go into the future and we look back on this Shemitah year, which was September 2021 to September 2022, we look back on it and we see that this was a Shemitah year and maybe the collapse occurred in the first six months of this year, which it did. And maybe the fact that bonds and stocks collapsed during that six month period would make it unusual and stand out as a reset or collapse or uh, just a, um, I guess you'd say just a reset. And you could, you could say that, and that, that may be the view that we have of this year. Or maybe we are looking forward in this next 47 days to a period of time where there will actually be a greater collapse, where the market has gone up recently in the last week or two, and then maybe there, or even this past month, maybe there is a collapse, a big collapse, that is in front of us. If you are in a buy and hold portfolio, and I've talked to so many people uh, who have contacted me and they have been in buy and hold portfolios and only with one exception, all of them report that their financial advisors told them, stay put, you're gonna be okay. And this did not, the way it got communicated and the way people heard it didn't come across very well. And so the financial advisors, in my little sampling, uh, over 95% of the people reported that their financial advisors did not attempt to reduce that risk by making any changes, getting them out of the market with the goal of getting them back into the market during more favorable times. And this frustrates people. It, and the people I've talked to have been very frustrated by it uh, because they uh, watched their portfolios sink and sink and sink and with nothing being done. And they were thinking and saying, what am I paying you for? You're doing nothing. And so our approach is different. Our approach is active management. And we got out of the market on the 7th of January, uh, all or in part. We did experience some losses, but they were minimal. They were quite a bit less than the market, but um, we wish they were zero. <laughs> but we did have some losses, but we did make a move early on to uh, reduce risk or get out of the market. And fortunately, within the past month, we've gotten back into the market and have taken advantage of some attractive gains. The key to active management and the key to these emotions of I want to get out of the market or I can't stand this risk is it, it's a double-edged sword because 
part of it says reduce risk. Okay, people usually kind of emotionally get that right, and some a little sooner than others, but they tend to realize, okay, I need to cut my losses and reduce risk. The problem comes not in that emotion. The problem comes in the counter emotion is when do you become offensive? When do you get back into the market? Because if you just become scared and the market hits an inflection point where it starts to go back up and you're not in the market, maybe the financial advisors are right. Maybe you just need to write it out. It may not be the best option, but it's better than getting out and missing the upside of the market. Because the stock market, investing in the stock market is comprised of two components. One component is losses and one part is gains. In our view, what we're trying to do is to cut the losses, to minimize the losses. So far, we've been able to do that. But also to take advantage of getting back into the market and take advantage of those gains. So that over time, as you look back over a year, or you know, six months, a year, two years, you look back and say, yeah, we cut losses, but we got back in early and we didn't have as far to climb out of the hole. That's our approach to active management. We do it with a, a, meth, you know, a, a mathematical methodology. But I'm telling you this thing, this about the Shemitah, because if you're in a buy and hold portfolio, and if we hit, I should say when, because when we hit a collapse, a real collapse, not one that's down 20% or 25%, but one that's down 50%, or 40% to the point where there is incredible pain. We have experienced this before. You know what I'm talking about. In my opinion, if you believe in history, I do, and historical cycles, we will go through that cycle again. Is that this year? Or is it next year? Or is it the year after? I obviously don't know. But I do know that at some point it's coming if you believe in cycles, and I believe in cycles. And uh, it will usually do what it does when you least expect it. And I'm just saying this because I want people to be prepared. These are frustrating conversations for people to have, and I feel sad for so many people who are experiencing these kind of losses. And so anyway, that's the reason I'm covering the um, Shemitah, because we are coming up on it. It's about a month and a half away. And maybe, as so many times in the past, that last month, that month of September, or most of September, is when the losses begin. We are just not that far away, and I thought it was noteworthy to cover it because it's not something uh, you see on uh, CNBC or Bloomberg, and uh, it does have a religious component to it. And uh, But I just thought I would uh, mention it because it's worth uh, taking note of because of the correlation, the incredible uh, level of correlation with uh, the stock market. I think about there are certain areas of risk that are in front of us. There are many areas of risk. We could get into supply, uh, food supply shortages, uh, supply chain issues, um, things like that. Uh, price of gasoline, you know, supply of gasoline, etc. But these are ones that I thought were are a particular note, and I want to give you some uh, data around these. Uh, credit card debt, home sales, home inventory, mortgages, and inflation. These are apart from uh, areas related to the Fed necessarily, or to, um, or to supply chain issues, food, food shortages, etc. So, um, I'll go through these, what I, uh, some data that I've noted around these five areas. Americans, this is amazing to me, Americans have opened 233 million credit card accounts since April. Since April. This data goes through June. So in three months, 233 million new credit card accounts have been opened. This is the largest amount of credit card openings in the last 14 years. Why do you think that is? Credit card debt is consumer debt, 
And in, you know, I believe that it's not wise. You're not going to get ahead if you are, uh, if you have credit card debt. Most of us know that. But what it tells me is that people, because of inflation, maybe other issues, but certainly inflation, people are finding it harder and harder to make ends meet. And so in order to put food on the table, pay their bills, pay their mortgage, etc., this is the only avenue left. That's what it tells me. Credit card debt is up 20% in three months. And the total credit card debt is close to crossing the $1 trillion mark. And so if the credit card debt is up 20% in three months, that tells me since April, the debt level has gone from 800 billion to a trillion approximately. So about a $200 billion increase in the amount of debt. Again, I think this is the reason why. People are trying to make ends meet. They're not trying to be financially unwise. Maybe some are, but most are not. Most are just trying to pay their bills, and this is the last avenue left. Housing. 8% of houses reduced their asking price over last, uh, uh, over last month, which is the highest in 22 years. So we have been in a very hot housing market. It's beginning to cool off. And we're not in a housing uh, crash at this point, but the, the, at this point, the peak is behind us. The average home price is down 12% in the last two months, the biggest in history. Home sales are down 16% in June, during a time when normally uh, this is the ideal season for um, buying homes. 15% of all sales fell through in June. Housing inventory is up for the first time in three years. Mortgage demand is the lowest in 22 years. What that tells me is, yes, some people are buying homes with a mortgage. Uh, even at these interest rates, they are. And but it also says, of course, that there's quite a few that are paying cash for their homes uh, and actually, in a number of cases, squeezing out people who have to get a mortgage. And inflation is at its highest level in 40 years. This is a the Buffett indicator chart showing the relationship. It's charting the ratio of corporate equities, and let's just say the stock market, to GDP, gross domestic product. And let's say the denominator, instead of GDP, let's just call it the economy. So the stock market divided by the economy, would, and that's plotted on the blue line. That would be a way of saying it. And you can see that ratio has come down. I pointed it with a red arrow, has come down in the last couple of months, or the last few months. When we take this chart, this is an exponential chart, logarithmic chart, but when I shift this to a longer time period, retain the exponential feature of it, but apply it to an inflation-adjusted exponential chart over 150 years, this is what it looks like. So this is the truest version of the stock market that I could give you. And this is with a red regression line drawn through the middle. So you can see when we push it out to 150 years on a logarithmic chart and inflation adjusted, you can see how far on the far right it has come down. Do you see how far it has to go? This is the S&P 500. This is not the ratio chart that we just saw. This is the S&P 500 but it is applied to the, the uh, logarithmic uh, methodology and inflation adjusted. So in other words, we are still elevated. This is before the month of July. This is through June. We are still elevated. 
So I, not to think that we are out of the woods. Maybe we're at the beginning of a new bull market. Maybe we are. We will know that uh, in hindsight. It doesn't feel like we should be, um, but I'm just pointing out how far we have come down and how little that is relative to historic standards. There is still a lot of air in the balloon. There is still a lot of excess in the system that needs to come out. Prices, stock prices are still elevated. Now, are you ready for some good news? Okay, I'll give you some good news. Uh, the price of gasoline has been coming down. Have you noticed? At the pump, this is good. So this chart shows you through the month of July, this is reported in August, but it's through the month of July, you can see the price of regular in the blue line and the price of premium in the red line, how far they have come down. That's good. So this is due to uh, oil inventories probably. Uh, so I just thought I'd show you on a chart of uh, the level that that's come down. I think we'd probably like to see it come down a lot more. Let's hope it does. But that's what it looks like. Okay, for the Bitcoin enthusiast, and I know there are some, uh, this is what the longer chart looks like going back to 2017, late 2017. And you can see the um, it's very volatile, but the level that it has gone up to and down and up and down and where it is today, when this chart was produced, uh, this was uh, through the end of July, it was about 22,000 and um, a long ways from its $65,000 peak. Is it going to go up from here or down from here? There's a lot of speculation on both sides of that, and I'm not going to speculate, but that's where it is. Okay, I want to show another video. This is uh, last Friday. Uh, there was a jobs report that came out, a very important jobs report, uh, because in the economy, you know, yes, we've got housing challenges, we've got stock market, bond market, inflation, interest rates, etc. Lots of challenges, but one of the things that's hanging out there, kind of the last frontier on the economic um, menu is jobs. What is happening with jobs? And so this is a, a, a I'll just play you a brief clip here uh, of uh, Rick Santelli, who's an interesting character, Rick Santelli on CNBC. And he is standing in front of the um, monitor showing the futures. This is about an hour before the stock market opened on Friday, showing the futures and what was happening with the futures. And as he's speaking at uh, 6.30, I believe it's 6.30 our time. Uh, this would be 8.30 Eastern. Uh, <laughs> you can watch what's happening to the stock market and the bond market. So the stock market, watch this when you watch this clip, the stock market futures are dropping. He's giving an incredibly positive report that 528,000 jobs are have been added and he's excited twice as much as was expected and it, it's a great report but what's interesting was the stock market and the bond market's reaction so the bond market the yields went up which means the price of bonds went down and the stock futures went down and friday ended the day as a negative day in both the stock market and bond market very interesting so, I'm sorry, 398,000. Oh, I'm sorry, that was June jobs. But this one is 528,000, I believe, for the month of July. So, listen to this, and then um, I'll make a comment at the end, and we'll move on. Yes, and uh, here we are, waiting for the big July jobs numbers, and it is a whopper, 528,000. 
528,000, basically double the expectations. And 528,000 is the best number since February when we were over 700,000. Uh, revisions to the last two months are 28,000. Now let's go through it, shall we? Uh, if we look at the unemployment rate, it's 3.5. It breaks a streak of four 3.6s in a row, at least until we see if the last month was revised or not. And if we look at average hourly earnings month over month, a nice little pop, a path of 1%. That is definitely juicy. We haven't been up half 1% since March, the high water mark, October of 21, when it was up six tenths, 5.2 year over year, also a nice pop. However, 5.6 of March is the high water mark, 34.6 on average hours work, and of course, 34.6, you want to pay close attention here, we're well off the pace of 34.9, much earlier in, in 21, and labor force participation rate moving the wrong way, 62.1, 62.1, that is the lightest since 61.9 in December of last year, that's not good, and the under Underemployment rate remains at 6.7. That's a post-COVID low. That's very, very good news all in all. We see that interest rates looked at this and they moved higher, rather dramatically higher. We moved up about seven or eight basis points in a 10-year and we're approaching 320 in a two-year. And do keep in mind that a two-year note uh, last Friday settled at 289. So that is a big move on a weekly basis, whereas a 10-year last Friday settled at 265. So even though both maturities are up, you can certainly see that the short maturities are up much more dramatically. Okay, my point in showing this is that the it is good news. And so I'm glad for that. But what's interesting is the stock market and bond market's reaction is that was negative. It's that, it, you know, if I tell you that the stock market is overvalued and the bond market is still overvalued and it doesn't take much to get them down, that's what I'm talking about. And it, and it also tells you that the stock market doesn't necessarily follow the economic data. Um, about five years ago, I got rid of my TVs. I don't have a TV. I don't want a TV. And that's the reason why. There's just this chatter that goes on that causes people to have an emotional reaction. And I would have that too if I watched it. And so that drives people's emotions. Interestingly, counter to that is some data. And this is uh, data through I don't know the actual week, if this is a week, probably a week or two old now, as far as the data reporting goes. But it compares this year's data to the average data of 2018 and 2019. In other words, pre-pandemic. So what is the jobless claims that have been filed? Now, this is a different number. It's looking at the other side of the equation from the jobs report, the jobs that were added. So the jobs that were added were positive. Of course, that came out after this report, but this is the jobless claims. Those two don't know, they should kind of move in opposite directions. Sometimes they don't. So uh, this shows that uh, during these past three weeks that re were reported, that the amount of claims relative to the average of 2018 and 19, uh, the jobless claims have gone up markedly. Now, what's interesting is there are jobs available. People can get a job if they want a job. And so it's interesting that the jobless claims have gone up. Um, maybe it's because we pay people not to work. That could be one reason. The this is a year-over-year -year number showing inflation in, uh, the, these are six different uh, G7 countries, uh, the US, uh, the UK, Italy, Germany, France, and Japan, going right to left. And the US has the highest level of inflation at about 9%. And this is, uh, you know, the uh, food, energy, and everything else. Uh, broken down. They, so they do vary quite a bit. 
but uh, it, the overall is we are leading these six countries, and I believe the G7, in the rate of inflation. Business activity has declined, and it is now at the lowest level it's been in 12 years, except during the pandemic, the for the basically second second quarter, third quarter of 2020, and it's dropping. So the this is the service services sector. Last week we looked at the manufacturing sector. There's no question the manufacturing sector is down, and now the services sector is down and is in a contraction mode. In other words, it's decreasing, not even increasing 1%. So we know that we're in a recession as measured by the level of contraction of uh, first and second quarters 2022, but this shows that the business activity inside of those quarters is dropping. So we'll see where this goes, but it's already at a negative level. In mortgages, mortgages went up to about six and a quarter percent, and this is more good news. They have now dropped to about five and a quarter, a little bit over five percent. This is the 30 year fixed rate mortgage. So it's interesting to how this is going to play out with home sales or even maybe in some cases refinance activity but it, it's a good thing that they didn't go from six and a quarter on further upward. Flow of funds report. Each week there is a flow of funds report. And what's interesting is, of course, the market, stock market has been going down for the first six months, but during the month of July and early August, the stock market has been going back up, kind of a bounce. And, but what's interesting is that during the month of July and early August, the flow of funds is out of equities. Equity fund outflows, 7.5 billion. While the market is going up, the big money, in my opinion, is quietly pulling money out of the market. Isn't that interesting? And the taxable bond market has an inflow of 3.9 billion. What that tells you is that there's a lot of money that right now, this is through the report was as of August 3rd, so it's about a week old. Uh, what that tells you is that there is still, the money is still in a risk averse mode. Okay, now to the dashboards. The major stock market indexes. This is the four major U.S. indexes. The Dow Jones Industrials measured by the ETF DIA, S&P by SPY, IWM is the Russell 2000, and QQQ is the NASDAQ 100. And then the emerging markets, uh, EEM, and the developed uh, foreign markets, EFA. So it takes all six of those, and I, I show where are those ETFs, those indexes, relative to their 20-day, 50, 100, and 200-day moving averages. So you can see, last week we had 16 green dots. I'm going to measure it by green dots. 60, uh, excuse me, uh, 16. This week we have 15. So similar, but down just a little bit. None of them have yet crossed back over after they'd all gone down. Uh, there was you know, what, a month or so ago, this was all red. So now we've started to get green dots and we're now 15 out of 24 uh, that are moving up over those averages and are in positive territory. When you look at the S&P 500, it's made up of uh, 11 industry sectors. And this measures the same thing on the right side of the chart, the four, four moving averages, 20 day, 50, 100, and 200 day moving averages. Where are these 
sectors relative to those moving averages. And so you can see some are doing better than others. Um, the one that's doing the strongest is the second one, which is consumer staples, um, household products. And that is, that is the only one that is above all four moving averages. And that's kind of a defensive sector. No surprise that it's uh, positive. I want to show you some charts. Uh, this is the S&P 500, measured over 12 weeks. It's a weekly chart, and one move equals one week. You can see through the black arrow on the right that the general direction is a downward direction. We are still in a bear market. We have rallied. This is called a bear market rally. We've rallied during this bear market, but it's still a bear market. So the general direction is down. However, what I did do is I put a circle around the end of this chart to show you that on the short term, this is measuring, what, about five or six weeks? During the short term, it is in an upward trend, short-term trend. And it's actually crossed over its 20-period moving average. So is that going to last? I personally don't think it will. But uh, this happens during bear markets. You have these short-term bear market rallies, and then it draws in enough people, and then it slams the door on them, and it goes on back down. So that's how people lose money in the stock market, <laughs> in my opinion. So the, when you put on a ratio, this chart is a ratio. It's the uh, relative difference between two indexes. The ratio numerator is growth stocks in the S&P 500 divided by denominator value stocks. And those are the two types of stocks in the S&P 500. So when with growth being the numerator, when it is moving in an upward direction, that shows that growth is in favor. When it is moving in a downward direction, it shows that value stocks or the value index is in favor. And so again, the downward direction shows that generally speaking, value is in favor in a macro view. However, I circled at the end of it, not unlike the last chart, the period of time where growth has gone into favor and is now up above its 20 period moving average. So generally positive in the short run, but long term still value is in favor. When we compare also a ratio chart, this uh, chart plots this ratio of small cap stocks, small cap index measured by IWM, the small cap Russell 2000 small cap uh, ETF as a numerator divided by SPY, the S&P 500 uh, ETF, as a denominator, when it is moving up, it is favoring small cap stocks. When it is moving down, it is favoring large cap stocks, which is the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is the 500 largest companies on the stock exchange. So you can see, and it is a 24 month chart, you can see during the first, what, six or eight months, small cap was in favor. Then it went down and large cap was in favor. The S&P 500 way outperformed the small cap index, causing that ratio to drop. I circled at the bottom the past month or two what is happening with small cap stocks? They have, it appears, at least in the short run, bottomed out and are starting to emerge as being a little bit stronger than the S&P 500 and have crossed back up over its 20 period moving average. So I'm not gonna say yet that this is a growth period for small cap, but it is more positive than it's been for the last year and a half. Long-term government bonds. The 20-year long-term government bond measured by the ETF TLT 
uh, when you look at it, I, I stretched this out to 30 months, so this is two and a half years. You can see these long periods of time where the bonds have been going down. So you can see the first arrow on the left, long-term bonds came down. It was back in there that we, somewhere that we exited any use of bonds in our portfolio, in our allocation, in our active management. We got out and we have not entered since. The arrow on the right is what has happened this year and actually began back in December. Bonds or bond funds or bond ETFs are part of portfolios. Now, this is just the long-term government bond. So there's the intermediate term, the short-term bond. The intermediate term bond is used quite a bit in portfolios. They've all done something like this. It's just that the magnitude of the loss is not as much for the intermediate and short term. Government bonds, uh, municipal bonds, et cetera, uh, even high yield bonds. So the, the trajectory has been down, which is, means this has made the losses in portfolios even worse than they would have been. So what people have counted on in the past is that bonds are going to somehow uh, support or counterbalance equity risk. That just didn't happen. And in some cases, the bond losses were even greater than the stock losses. So when people who thought they had protection looked at their portfolios and saw, wow, I'm down 20% or 25%, and I've talked to people over 30% losses in portfolios, 20% is kind of a minimum. But it, 20 to 25 was pretty much the norm. And this is the culprit that added to that problem, or at least it didn't protect it. Gold, this is a 48 month chart. So over four years, I stretched it out so you could see a pattern here. Gold ha goes up and down a lot. And when I put this black line across there to show a level of what looks like a level of support for, for gold. So as it goes up and down over this, what is this, a couple of year period of time, two, two and a half year period of time, Gold has gone up and down and up and down, but when it goes down, it has not gone below that black line. That's called support. And so it appears now to have um, uh, recognized that level of support and is probably in a place where it's going in an upward trajectory. We shall see. Silver, and I'm going to move over to an 18 month chart because this is a uh, silver's similar but a little different animal. Uh, silver is more volatile than uh, gold. It did not have that kind of support pattern that gold had and has been generally in a downward direction for uh, the last year or so. So what's interesting, I'm going to come back to this. At the very end of this chart, you see the, the last move of this chart is down. It was, silver was not down last week. It was an incredible positive week. Why is this down? I'm going to cover that in a future slide. The relationship of silver to gold, and this is using the ETFs SLV and GLD, in a 24-month period of time, if it goes up, this means that silver is in favor. If it goes down, it means gold is in favor. So gold has been in favor for approximately the last 18 months or so. Volatility. The volatility index, when it generally crosses below at least 24, uh, that is considered to be a positive indicator for the market. It means volatility is being reduced. Volatility means negative volatility. So it, it, if it goes down, generally risk is tending to come out of the market. If it goes up, that means risk is entering the market. And you can see for the past um, couple of months that uh, risk has begun to come out of the market. And we'll see where it goes from here, 
but uh, this has been a general positive direction uh, for the last couple of months. I'm going to jump over to Asbury Research. They provide indicators in the last week or two, I think both weeks, they have been, all six of their indicators have been positive, meaning in the middle column, green boxes, measuring uh, six different uh, metrics. This week, one of them, as of Friday, uh, turned negative. So five out of six are positive. This is the cross asset relative performance. So this is performance now uh, of one class of stock to another, or one class of uh, assets to another. Uh, U.S. stocks versus bonds. Stocks are in favor. This is measuring the weekly, the last week, the last month, and the last quarter in those three last columns. Uh, high beta stocks are in favor over low beta, low beta or low volatility stocks. Small cap, as we saw earlier, is in favor in all three categories over large cap. The S&P 500 is in favor over the Dow Industrials. And that was not true for most of the, la of the first six months of this year, but it's now shifted so that the S&P is now stronger than the Dow. And the NASDAQ is stronger than the S&P in all three time periods. A lot of this relates to the previous charts that I just showed you and bears out what the charts are saying. Growth, as we saw, is in favor currently over value. However, during the first six months, most of that time, value was in favor. Uh, the U.S. is in favor over developed markets. And in two out of three cases, the U.S. is in favor over emerging markets. Corporate bonds are more in favor over government bonds. Now, they both may be down, but corporate would be down less. High yield is in favor over corporate bonds. And long-term uh, bonds are, in two out of three cases, more in favor than uh, short-term bonds. This is a chart on gold and silver. This is as of Friday. Gold, now this is the spot price of gold without the markup, and this is not the ETF. This is the spot price of gold, the core price, if you will, and on top of which is a commissioner markup. The spot price of gold was $17.29 per ounce, which is a gain of 2.8% over the previous week. Silver, 19.91% up 7% over, up over the previous week. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Silver is up 7%. What was it the previous week? It was up 9.5%. The compounding effect of last week and this week put silver up over 17% for that two-week period of time. Why did SLV, the ETF for silver, why was it down? It was down because SLV, while it's a surrogate for silver, and I use it to report on because it's easier for me to get information on, is not always moving in the direction or at the rate of the um, SLV is not moving in the direction of the spot price, vice versa. So I want to bring this so you can see 7% increase week over week. I double checked it. This chart, which I showed you a little bit ago, down. Silver was down last week, not silver. SLV was down. It was not, silver was not down, but SLV was down. So this brings me to a point I want to make 
about the difference between SLV and silver. Now, I've told you before, I prefer to buy silver as an alternative asset, as um, an alternative to the currency of the dollar, if it's ever needed. And I hope I never need it, but if I do, I have it. And I don't buy it as an investment, I buy it as an insurance policy. But if you buy SLV or GLD as a, as a means to hedge against the decline of the dollar, be careful, be careful. I have two problems with that. One, it is denominated in dollars. And if you're trying to protect against the, val the decline of the dollar, how does something denominated in dollars help you? If you can answer that question, please let me know. I have not found anybody that can answer it. And secondly, at times, it is not correlated with the asset itself. So I dug into this and I found that the market value, and I just used GLD, I did not use SOV, but I, I could. But the market value of GLD is $72 billion. The gold that is backing it, and there is gold behind, real physical gold behind that ETF, the value of it is 0.82 billion. You can see that the amount of silver, that the amount of ETFs that are out there is many, many, many times more, volumes more, than the silver behind it. In other words, it is wide open for speculation. The American philosopher, great philosopher, Will Rogers, said, I'm not so much interested in the return on my money as I am in the return of my money. Will Rogers was born in the late 1800s and died in a plane crash in 1935. During the latter part of his, and he was an interesting entertainer, um, you know, actor, you know, just colorful personality, but died in a plane crash in 1935 and the kind of at the prime of his life actually. But at that time, during the previous five years or so, he was talking to people and observing people who had lost everything in the stock market and because of the Great Depression. And so when he makes a statement like this, I think it sits in, with the backdrop of the Great Depression and the many conversations he had with people at that time. Thank you for watching. If you have comments, leave them in the comment section below. I try to answer many of them. And um, if you want to reach out to me, I, here's my contact information. I appreciate hearing from you. Thank you for watching.